In 2001, the Center for Art in Wood, in collaboration with Yale University Art Gallery, presented Wood Turning in North America since 1930. Its young curator was a PhD student named Glenn Adamson. Fifteen years later, the center is presenting Wood Revisited, an international exhibition. And Glenn Adamson had a hand in this show as well. This is an exhibition about recent technologies and how they've been applied to creativity in wood. It was curated by Anne Carlyle, and this is her first curatorial project. I'm glad to say I served as an advisor to her, and she's brought together an extraordinary group of objects uh, by an international array of artists, all using new technologies. Uh, so for example, there's 3D printing and 3D guided routers in the exhibition. There's laser cutting, like this extraordinary piece behind me. Also, there are artists that have used digital design techniques to envision their forms before they make them. So it's really a sampler or a kind of itinerary of what's been made possible through new technologies as they've been applied to this traditional medium. Hi, I'm Ann Carlisle. I'm the curator of Wood Revisited that is going on October 28th here at the Center for Art and Wood in Philadelphia. I first heard about this show when one of my professors at Bard Graduate Center mentioned that Glenn Adamson was looking for someone to fill a role that he had played curating his first show at the Center for Art and Wood. I've been working on this show since last January. The parameters were pretty broad. And I had to think about what the idea of technology meant, which led to this concept of the tech aesthetic. And I actually conducted a lot of this research over the internet, looking at images, trying to find connections, common ground between the work. It was an incredible experience to explore different artists with really no limitation on who or what I could possibly choose. We finally narrowed it down to a little over 20 pieces, which I think are all really strong in their own way. We have everything from textiles to chairs to sculpture in this show. Something that's been surprising is how a piece might make reference to technology in the way that it looks, even though it could be made using hand techniques, hand tools, traditional woodworking. And then conversely, looking at something that is made using a CNC router or laser cut, and the organic qualities that come through are very human and not necessarily something we immediately associate with technology. My name is Yuri Kobayashi, and I was born in Japan and I moved to the United States about 15 years ago. This piece is titled A Being, and it is a skyscraper-like structure that represents my interpretation of human beings in abstract format. What's it made out of? Ash, all ash. Did you have to cut all the wood yourself? Yes, I did using our machines and, and I do drawing, a really rough drawing, not CNC or computer drawing. I'm not good at the computer drawing at all, so many joints, lap joint and mortise and tenon. What other kinds of work do you do? Do you make furniture? Yes, I do, but mostly sculpture. That's where my passion goes. I went to graduate school at San Diego State University. Back then, Wendy Mariama was the head of the department. She influenced my life greatly, and that's why I'm here. My work switched drastically because of her from functional piece to sculpture. Something we have tried to address in this show is the fear around moving into using new technology. 
trying to make the point that new technology is not something that should be viewed as scary, but it's another tool to put in the arsenal for woodworkers and wood artists so that they can better realize their vision. Uh, my name is Hunt Clark. I am from Sparta, Tennessee. What inspired you to start adding video to your sculptures? It's been sort of a long process. I guess back in 1999 I started doing some larger installation with video where I was using a lot of robotics and projecting them on other uh, surfaces. This piece is an evolution of those uh, larger installations. The video itself looks like trucks driving on a highway. Using the traffic showed that there was a, an actual line and a destination. And when you have that in your mind and an idea of where one point goes to the other point, you really start to see the mishaps and the weird things that start to happen on the uneven surfaces. It's much easier for your eye to see that and say, OK, that's what's being manipulated instead of the video being manipulated. Some of the artists were chosen because they seemed to be channeling the digital aesthetic without actually departing from traditional ways of making. Good examples of that would be Tom Loser. I'm Tom Loser. Bad ideas for boats. Who uses bent wood techniques, rather like a boat builder, but has done it in such a way that it almost looks like the pieces have been distorted or morphed through a computer design program. Two pieces that are in the show are part of a series that I made after building a couple of real boats and learning the boat building techniques and I got the idea of messing around with bad ideas for boats. Other mechanisms by which boats might move through the water, like they might swim like a fish or they might screw their way through the water like an Archimedes screw or they might roll their way through the water like a wheel. Where are you from? I'm Madison, Wisconsin. I run the woodworking program at the university, and boats have been the significant theme of the visiting artists that I like to bring in. So we did have a Ojibwe birch bark canoe builder come and build a canoe from start to finish, and a couple of other boat builders, and so that's how I got interested in the techniques and the technology and the methodology. Another great example of that would be Bud Latvin, an artist that the center has worked with for a long time and is well known for these turnings that he makes by gluing together lots of small pieces of wood, often called polychromatic turning, but he did it in a way that seems to be inspired by pixelation, the way that an early computer screen would look. And that, I think I'm right in saying, is the chronologically earliest piece in the show. And to me, it almost suggests a kind of digital prehistory for the rest of the exhibition. And then one other person to mention in that context would be Sebastian Aratsuriz, and he is a Chilean-born designer who works in New York City. What he's given us is a hand-carved model that looks for all the world like it might be 3D printed. And it also, again, has this kind of morphed tentacular form that looks like it's something that was cooked up on a computer screen. So. A lot of these objects suggest the way that the digital is starting to inform the way the artists see, as well as how they actually make. There's one piece that looks like fabric, and it's incredibly thin. That is a work by Elisa Strozik, and that is an extraordinary thing. It's made of lots of small triangles of wood that have been laid out again in a computer-aided design program and then put together with flexible joints so that the wood can bend and shift in the way that drapery would. So she's drawing on her knowledge of textile design, history and practice of textile design, but she's using digital technology to apply it to this unconventional medium of wood. It's interesting to think about the relationship between nature and technology in this show because while technology is the driver, a lot of the objects actually look natural. And a great example of that might be Joris Larman's work. He is a Dutch designer who is very strongly influenced by natural forms. So in the past, he's done works that look like bone structures, for example, or vegetal structures. And one of the things that he's often remarked upon is the fact that an algorithm, if allowed to do its own work, will actually produce a form that looks a lot like what nature produces. 
and so he's one person who's noticed the strong intersection between digital aesthetics and naturalist aesthetics. There's also occasionally bursts of humor. One guy seems to have used a Marilyn Monroe movie as an yeah. influence. Yeah. So hi, my name's uh, Alexander White. I'm from uh, London, UK. And this is my chair, Monroe chair. It was an attempt to simplify the manufacturing process in uh, making an armchair. There's 83 identical components, all cut on a CNC router machine. They all are fed onto a pole that runs through the middle of the chair, around which these components rotate. They are fixed into place with dowels and screws and glue to create what is the chair and, and the shape that it's got. The title is intriguing. It was named after Marilyn Monroe uh, because of a dress in the Seven Year Itch when she steps over the subway grate. So that's where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> so Marilyn is popular in merry old England? Absolutely. She's an icon all over the world. I also think of the wonderful piece by David Nozanchuk which looks like something hurtling through space that's magically been infested with these beautiful winged creatures. It's quite a surrealist object. And he's another great example of somebody whose imagination has really been opened up by the digital. My name is David Nosenchuk, and this piece above me is called Butterfly Asteroid. It's the combination of a known asteroid that's been carved out of a foam block from a CNC and then fiberglass. So we have an exact scale replica uh, internally lit of an asteroid and covered in the asteroid is the Lamenthus butterfly known as the Meadow Wanderer. The wings of the butterfly are made out of a laser engraved beach veneer that becomes so thin that it becomes transparent as the light penetrates through the wings. The bodies are made out of a bronze that uh, resulted from a 3D scan of a real butterfly body, followed by a digitizing, then a 3D print, then a silicone mold, and then lost wax casting, which is a very long process. Uh, the butterfly and the asteroid uh, appear to be in opposition to each other, but in fact they have a lot of similarities. They both result in being able to fly through a metamorphosis of some type, butterfly obviously through a caterpillar's uh, life, and the asteroid as a remnant of the solar system's creation. And both have either migratory or orbital paths that can be mapped and recognized in a consistent way. What gives a person the idea of putting butterflies on an asteroid in the first place? A lot of people have asked me this question. I still don't know. One other person who we can't fail to mention would be Wendell Castle, of course, who's arguably the greatest wood artist of the post-war period. And he is now in his 80s, so an octogenarian designer, and just recently acquired and started to use a computer-driven robot to carve his work. And the piece that we have in the show is a good example of that. He was able to use the robotic carving arm to achieve lots of things that he was always imagining in his work, but never able to achieve just the ability to carve pieces rapidly without having to either hire somebody to do it or do it himself. So it's really expanded his means of production in a very important way. Hi, I'm Christopher Kurtz. I'm a sculptor who created this piece called Singularity. All hand-carved basswood. This came mostly from an improvisational way of working. I would study different kind of forms all the way from cracked ice to spider webs to rays of sunlight. And my background in furniture making gave me a vocabulary of techniques. So it has the scale and touch of like furniture making, but dealing with ideas that could be as small as a spider web or as vast as the, the Big Bang. So there's lots of different entry points. It's kind of anthropomorphic. It feels a little bit animal-like. Parts of it feel a little bit human-like, but it remains completely abstract. I would just encourage the viewer to bring whatever kind of experience they have to it. I don't want to really dictate what the piece is about. Just hours before the opening of Wood Revisited, a missing artwork finally arrived. Our missing coffee table that came from the Netherlands, cleared customs, and then vanished. Are you UPS or the post office? Look, the post office. How did the post office, the post office, post office get it? The shipper said it was turned over to UPS. Mm -hmm. and here's a tracking number. I said, but that's a Dutch tracking number. That doesn't do right. anybody any good. Right. The post office is going to be the star of this movie. Thank you. 
This exquisitely crafted table was definitely worth the wait, but it does seem that high technology, at least that of transcontinental shipping and tracking, isn't always what it's cracked up to be. Wood turning has always been a very traditional craft. Is there any pushback to the old timers against these newfangled techniques? I think that artists, generally speaking, are happy to have any tool put into their hands. So you might expect that traditional craftspeople would look at 3D printing, for example, or a computer-driven router and say, well, the humanity's gone. This doesn't have the kind of integrated touch that we want in a wooden object. But in fact, what I've experienced is that people are curious about what these tools can do. And if you think about it, all of these artists have been using new tools and technologies for centuries. Electrically powered or gas powered chainsaws, for example, or ornamental lathes when they were invented in the 16th and 17th centuries. Or going back even further, if you think about the introduction of tool steel that made it possible to create totally different kinds of object. Technology has always been a driver for artists. It's just a matter of what you can do with that technology and how you can master it and use it as a way of unleashing your creative vision rather than having your vision determined by the technology. For my money, the really key thing is to make sure that we are the masters of the tools and not vice versa. I'm just overwhelmed with the fact that we found a young, brilliant curator. She's a student. I'm speechless, to tell you the truth. And she found this incredible variety of work, literally from all over the world. 20 years ago, when we did the show, we spent two years traveling around, visiting artists and collectors and museums. But she did it all through the internet. There's no words to describe how well the show looks and the work relates to each other so well. I just walked in today for the first time to see the show, and it is incredible. I assume today's your first day of seeing it. Yeah, walking in, my jaw definitely hit the floor. Not just because the art was so amazing, but that I just couldn't believe that I was afforded the opportunity to put something like this together. As the mother of the show, you should be very proud of yourself. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like it took a village. <laughs> <laughs> Karen has done an incredible job putting this show together. Dan, Sal, our exhibition designer, everyone who's had a hand in the show deserves a lot of credit. Glenn is one of the most incredible thinkers in this field. It's been an incredibly valuable experience to go about curating something under his eye. And Albert has been an incredibly generous resource as well. He is this father figure within the Center for Art and Wood. He's so knowledgeable, this font of knowledge that at any time you can ask him a question and he will be able to tell you in detail and breadth anything you could possibly want to know. Well, I want to know, who are these people? I'm Elizabeth Agra. <laughs> and I'm Albert Leekoff. All right, Elizabeth, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> I curate fantastic installations and exhibitions at the PMA. And Albert, what do you do? I am the leading factor that has put the wood, the wood world on fire with bringing the attention of people to the Center of Art and Wood. And I am the director of this fabulous institution. All right, it's All right. so nice to meet you two. <laughs> nice to trade places. Yeah. <laughs>